Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that we're able to do things in person again. And uh, just, uh, I'm I'm really surprised that this many people showed up too. And I did, yeah. I jokingly said I paid some of you, but I did salt the audience with a few of my friends. <laughs> some of them would be. So anyway, well, I have had the opportunity twice to go to Mexico with the uh, Sister Cities of Springfield program and the Friends of the Garden. My first trip was in February of 2017. I'm like, I can't believe that was five years ago already. And the second trip was February of 2020. And most of you can probably remember what happened in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. So we were already talking about COVID and what was all that going to be. And, um, but we got this trip in and it was great fun. And both trips have been great fun. So um, we are going to talk a bit about Mexico. We're going to hear some mariachis and we're going to see some. Hopefully you'll enjoy the pictures of the monarchs. So. You probably recognize this one on the left, um, but I wanted to show in relation where we are and when we are in Tlacopaque. We're just west of Mexico City over here. We're actually in the same time zone when you're in Tlacopaque, so that makes it easy. It's not a difficult trip to get there. Um, the two times I believe I've gone, we've either gone through Dallas or Houston, Remember the last time we, we went through Houston and it's, you know, hour and a half, two hours uh, uh, for each flight. So it's not a difficult uh, uh, trip down there. The other, we fly into Guadalajara. That is the closest uh, airport to uh, Tlacopaki. And Tlacopaki is actually uh, like a suburb of Guadalajara. Something I read when I was, you know, putting things together said it's like a 10 minute drive or something. And I'm like, boy, they must have done that at Sunday morning at 3 a.m. <laughs> because as you can imagine, traffic in Mexico is is a little little a uh, little more uh, problematic than, than it is in Springfield. But whoops. And there we go. I'm I'm a little out of practice with. Mm -hmm. remotes and, and presentations too, so bear with me. Uh, if you can see, Tlacopaki is right there. There's the littlest dot right next to Guadalajara. That green is the state of Jalisco. And um, uh, some of the things we're going to see are going to be in the state of Jalisco. It's like being in the state of Missouri. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many, like 14 states or something mm -hmm. in the country of Mexico. And this is a beautiful uh, sculpture that they have in a courtyard there, just off the main square in Tlacopaque. So, there we go. Uh, it has been a Springfield sister city since 2003. So uh, you know, almost 20 years. Lots of trips back and forth, uh, us going down there and folks from Tlacopaque coming up here. Um, the peace through people is the uh, uh, motto, I guess, of our sister city program here in Springfield. And they refer to Tlacopaque as a pueblo magico. Um, it offers visitors special experiences because of the area's natural beauty, their cultural heritage, traditions, folklore, and the history. Um, you can't go any place without seeing an old church. Every little town has an old church down there and the arts and crafts and that sort of thing. Now, place above clay land. This is another thing. Every page that you see about Tlacopaki and describing Tlacopaki has a different quote what Tlacopaki means. <laughs> Muddy Hill and uh, some things like that. But that um, is called that because of the special soil that they have in that area. And uh, it creates a special uh, ceramic sculpture that has drawn a lot of artisans to that area. And that's one of the biggest draws to that city is the number of artisans that you can see when you uh, get down there. 
So the Museo Premio Nacional de Ceramica. This is close enough to our words. You can probably figure out the National Ceramic Museum sculpture is located in Tlacopaque. So I um, I went there the first time and I've got some photos to show you. Mm -hmm. I was so fascinated with it. I made a special trip back the second time I went down there because it's just the uh, beauty of the, the sculptures that they have there. There are two people in particular that we spend time with when we go down there. There are two brothers, uh, Rodo and Paco Padilla. They are internationally known. And you go to this little city in Mexico and you get to talk to these guys. Rodo has uh, like galleries in Miami and things like this and thousands of dollars for some of his works. And Paco is well known as well. So the upper left there is, uh, let me see if I can find Paco. Oh, there he is, he's right in the center. The fellow in the kind of lavender shirt there. This is his home. Both trips I've been down there, he has invited, he and his wife have invited us to come and have lunch at his home. And you get to sit out there on the little porch and uh, big fun and, and his wife and uh, their assistant, uh, I can't remember. Melissa, do you remember? Do we have enchiladas or tamales? Tamales. I thought it was tamales. And I mean, it's it's the real deal. It's not the kind my mom used to serve me from the can. When I <laughs> <laughs> so, and a uh, great group of people. These are all folks from Springfield. Lisa Bankering in the back with the blonde hair. She is the executive director of our sister cities program now. And so she has been on both trips, um, some familiar faces there. Uh, the gentleman in the right is Roto Padilla, and he's also in the bottom uh, photo. And this, um, yeah, it was the second trip we were on, I believe. Uh, if you see this, oh, I'm sorry. Bear with me. Here we go. The pointer. Uh, does anybody recognize this? Does it look familiar to anybody? Yes, that is a. That was the bench that is now at the Peace Through People Pavilion at the Springfield Botanical Center. That was he was he created that bench for Springfield. And we got to see it before the black tiles were applied to it. And so we got the, we got the sneak peek of, of what the new bench was going to be like. And the, obviously the, the photo at the bottom is, is one of his sculptures that's literally out in, uh, in front of his gallery there in uh, Colorado. <laughs> um, the upper left is a photo from Rodo's gallery. And you can see that this is the sort of thing that I can afford to buy <laughs> from his uh, studio. Um, the uh, fella up on the right-hand side, that I put it in there, the clay mud is worked by hand, so to speak. It's really worked by feet. <laughs> was this your picture, Melissa? Yeah, yeah. Melissa was on the second trip with me. So that's that's what this guy does all day. It's, they and then mix a little more, mix a little more. And then on the shelf, you can see in both of those photos the molds that they use for all their work that they create. And then the bottom photo is the oven where the things are baked after they're formed. And Roto is not a short guy. This, I'm guessing this door that he, he was pushing the door uh, of the oven closed and I'm guessing it is about seven feet tall and six or seven feet across. It's quite a large oven. And it is just packed to the gills. You can see all of those are just little individual ceramics that he's getting ready to fire there. So, now the mariachis. Is this going to work, Heather? Thank you. 
Anybody recognize that tune? You ever heard that before? Well, we were sitting having lunch. I believe this was the first trip I was on. And I said, well, let's just go down this little place. These are kind of friends of ours. We'll have lunch there. And we're sitting there eating and chatting. And all of a sudden, these fellas all dressed up, just come right on in with their, with their uh, uh, equipment and their uh, instruments there. And it's, it's one thing to hear it here. And it's another to sit there and, and have it right there in front of you. <laughs> Very talented folks. Several of them have been here to Springfield. So we've had the opportunity to be here too. So these are some of the artisans that um, uh, Melissa is up there in the left-hand corner. She gave me permission to go ahead and use it because I didn't know how to crop her out anyway. So. <laughs> anyway, and the lady on the right-hand side is an artisan that I bought a little something from. So I got to uh, watch her. Uh, paint right there on the they're literally out on the sidewalk in front of the little shops in the main main uh it's a pedestrian mall there yes a question from the back would it be better for us to see if the lights were off I, I do you want to try that well it's yeah. up to you yeah i'm sorry that's because these are great photos some of them are mine oh Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the yes, Yeah, yeah. Um, and that um, is the main church there in Talakapake, and it's just right off the square. Um, and again, just um, just fascinating to watch these folks sit there and just paint. And it's like, I, I don't know how long it would take me to work on that, some kind of embroidery like that or or <laughs> paint that amount of goods. They pack them up, um, bring them out every morning, set them out on the, the sidewalk there and pack them up all at night and go back to their homes wherever they are. So very colorful, very colorful and beautiful. This is um, the ceramics museum that I was telling you about. And these are just all hand produced. Um, the little marching band up there on the top, those fellas are about five or six inches tall. And there was a whole entire marching band. And I, I just, uh, I, they had to like drag me out the first time. <laughs> like They're like, wait, I have to go someplace else. Wait, but I want to see more. And the one with the, it's actually a cockfight. I'm not sure you can see it from where you guys are. You can see the clown holding the balloons. All of that is hand sculpted. And that item is about the size of a shoebox. If you can imagine doing all that in miniature. And then the other little, uh, it looks like a little coach with the folks all around it there uh, in the bottom corner. So, um, and it was very difficult to put this together. The hardest part was picking out which photos. And I told Heather this morning, I, I had to add another slide of some photos toward the end. So uh, it's beautiful stuff. And what would a trip to Mexico be without a little tequila? <laughs> so tequila is uh, another town uh, about, I don't know, about 30 to 40 minutes west of, uh, of uh, Tlacopaque. And uh, I got to go there on both trips. The first trip, we uh, had a tour of the... Um, Jose Cuervo, that is the headquarters of Jose Cuervo. And they had quite a tour uh, of that. The upper top picture there is an agave field. And in that section of Jalisco, uh, you will just see literally miles and miles of these agave fields. And the bottom right is, uh, those are called pineapples. 
That is actually the center of the agave plant. You're going to see a video here in just a second um, of how they uh, how they <laughs> attack mm -hmm. the uh, agave plant. So the second trip, we went to a different um, uh, a different uh, tequila factory, much smaller. Uh, it was owned by three women. And they had just uh, not too uh, long before that gone into the business of making tequila on their uh, property there. So let's see if we can get this one. Take a look at that tool that he is using. And it's very close to his foot. <laughs> Yeah, that's not like a little palm in your backyard. That's uh, that agave plant. Yeah. Yeah. That, that whole thing is above the ground. I don't know if you could hear that person speaking, but he's just taking uh, uh, the, all those all those blades off. The blades are then. Uh, uh, collected and, and composted for, you know, to rejuvenate the fields. And um, that pineapple is saying, whoops, there we go. Oh, well, okay. The pineapple is then taken into the factory. It is literally roasted for hours and hours and hours. And that makes it, I, I'm not prepared to explain the tequila process, but I did taste some while I was there. <laughs> and um, they they actually had like you know the the how you exit through the gift shop. They had a huge gift shop of premium tequilas and reserve tequilas and the mm -hmm. behind locked door tequila bottles. <laughs> so, anyway, but the main reason uh, I went down was uh, to visit the overwintering sites for the monarchs. And this is, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, the uh, migration pattern, they overwinter down here in Mexico and you see the green arrows. Um, they start around March when things are starting to warm up. They, they leave uh, the area in Mexico and they start heading up. They, the first, bunch or grouping will get up to northern Mexico and southern Texas and uh, stop there, so to speak. There's actually four to five generations of monarchs that proceed up through the United States. And so probably here in southwest Missouri, we're probably getting the second generation uh, when we see them in the springtime. If you see them probably around June, around here, that would be about the second generation. Then the third and fourth generation go up as far as well up into Mexico and New England and that sort of thing. And about this time of year, I've seen a few uh, posts on Facebook just this week that people are starting to see monarchs again. This is the group that's heading back. They're on the way back. Um, I've seen them, uh, late September, early October at my own home. And they are, I said, it's hard to think of a butterfly being fat, <laughs> but they are literally uh, stocking up reserves to fatten up and have enough energy to make it the, um, I looked it up, I think it's 3,000, yeah, 3,000 mile trip. And one generation, um, who would probably be born down in this area down here will make that last trip all the way down to uh, Mexico. That happens around November. They come back around the Day of the Dead, which we call Halloween here. Day of the Dead down there. The Mexico, uh, the Mexican natives feel that because it's around the Day of the Dead, they feel that it's the spirits of their loved ones coming back to. Uh, return to Mexico. So I had there's lots more detail about the the migration, but um, we'll go on to 
see, uh, I don't know that it was really hard for me to find a really good map of Mexico and to give you a really great idea of where the sanctuary was that we went to. The one we went to is called Sierra Chinqua. And if you can see way up there, um, it's between Tlacopaque and Mexico City. It's really closer to Mexico City. It's maybe about an hour west of there. We took about a five to six hour bus trip from Tlacopaque. We left there and then uh, stayed in a place near Sierra Chinqua uh, overnight before we went to the reserve. But you can see there's quite a number of them throughout this particular area. And uh, <clears throat> the reason that they're all kind of concentrated in this area is they're on a specific tree and that tree only grows in this area of Mexico. And it really wasn't discovered until the 19th, well, the people in Mexico knew about it all along. They just knew they left and they came back. But people didn't realize the, the extent of the migration in the 70s um, was when uh, they really started to put this together of, of how the migration actually occurred. The white chart over here shows um, the population of monarchs in Mexico. How they come up with this, uh, these figures is they literally um, use aerial photography to determine how many acres are covered, where they are found as they overwinter. And they measure it by hectares. And that's about as much as I can explain <laughs> how they do the calculation. There's nobody out there counting trees or anything like that, because you'll see in a minute the massive amounts of butterflies you see in one place when you're down there. But as you can see, this is not a very good trend line. And I was looking at it, the last time there was an increase three years in a row was over here, 94, 95, 96. And only once since then, there was two years in a row where the populations went up. And you can see how they're declining. And one of the issues, not the major issue, I don't think, but a significant portion, as you see in this photograph, these white areas, that's clear cutting. And uh, the Mexican government has set up these uh, they're called Biosphera. It's, it'd be like a national forest that we have here. Um, uh, and it's illegal to go in there and cut, but when people don't have enough to eat and you can't have money to feed your kids and things, you're gonna do what you need to do to feed your family. Now, when I first looked at this photo over here on the right, I looked at this and I'm like, boy, there's something wrong with those trees. They're all dying of something. Those are monarchs covering the trees. Yeah, yeah. that's that is how massively they cover the uh, the these these particular fir trees. This is the area where we went. I I got to visit here twice, as I was saying. It's a federal protected area and in the reserve. And I'm sorry these aren't a little bit clearer when we you know, throw them up so big. But this uh, map over here is similar to the one I showed you a minute ago with the monarch reserves on them. Mariposa means butterfly in Spanish. So it's a uh, Reserva de la Veracera de Mariposa Monarca. My, my lips don't work that well. Anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, these... Um, Golly, the first time I was there, there were people, um, I think there were people from Canada that we met. Uh, there was some other, he seemed to be some kind of a dignitary, perhaps from Europe. It was a foreign language that I, that I couldn't really put a handle on. And he had people escorting him and his family around. So I, I felt like I was some kind of a dignitary or something like that. So this is the primary, a real primary source of income for the people in this area of Mexico is the tourism attracting people from the United States and even from Europe 
who will make the trip and come and stay. And, uh, you know, you, you, you stay in a hotel and you eat and you buy a few souvenirs and things like that. So it's, uh, they are trying to convince the people to stop logging, stop cutting things down. If, if we can attract the tourists, it'll be better than you trying to, you know, taking away all the trees. So uh, the, probably I think the biggest part, and this is just conjecture on my part, I don't have scientific evidence for it, the loss of habitat here in the United States. We used to have, the farmers used to have fields and they'd have a fence and there'd be, um, you know, 10, 20 feet or something like that where the tractors couldn't get and that sort of thing. So there'd be all full of wildflowers. And that's what the monarchs need is they're, as they're uh, progressing. And now with the equipment and everything, we want to take down all the fences and you, they can um, farm. I'm not trash and farmers, please don't take it that way. But it's just the technology that we have. We don't have those fence rows. We don't leave fields fallow anymore. Um, the wildflowers are gone. They mow the the rights away of the highways and things like that. They're, we're just losing all that habitat that those migrating butterflies need. And it's not just monarchs. Monarchs are very popular. Um, oops, there we go. Um, they're, they're kind of the, uh, the uh, you know, the Tom Hanks of butterflies or something, you know, the Madonna or who's, who's big now? Rihanna, whatever, I don't know. But they're, they're the stars, the celebrity butterflies, but all of the butterflies, all the pollinators need that kind of habitat. One of the fellows on the trip had this gizmo and he was showing it to us. I don't know if you can see it in the back. Uh, 10,440 feet was the elevation when we were at the visitor center there. So that's quite high. And we went higher than that to when we went off into the forest to find the actual monarchs. And Sierra Chinqua, as I said, it's located west of Mexico City about an hour or so. And I've kind of talked about this a little bit. November to March, they are down there in the overwintering sites. Oyomel is the type of tree. It's a fir tree that uh, is down there that only grows again over 10,000 feet. Uh, you, you drive to the visitor center and then the monarchs actually move within the preserve uh, over the months that they're down there. They'll you know be here for a little while and go over there for a little while and move over there. So you kind of have to have a guide there that you meet up with who will take you to where they are that particular day. So, uh, it's a hike into the forest to see them, and uh, you are to be silent. So, because too many people, too much motion, too much uh, hubbub, you're going to disturb. You literally disturb the butterflies, and they they remind you that uh, you are in the butterflies' home. It's not the other way around. So. Uh, the upper left there is just a little view of, uh, this is just a few feet off of the visitor center. So you can see in the background all the, uh, uh, the trees of the, how thick the forest is. And uh, that's kind of the, just the feel of what the place looks like. The upper left there is um, a view that one of my friends took that photo. Uh, you can see how high up you are when you're up there. And I have a little bit of a lung issue and that was, that was a big deal being up that high um, uh, for me to be hiking around. But I unfortunately told the Lisa the last time we were there, I said, you know, if I come up to you next year and say, I wanna go again, I'm telling you right now, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I may come and say, I wanna go, but you need to remind me. <laughs> so, and you know, just your first picture of of how many uh, butterflies you might see uh, when you're just walking around up there in the in the hillside. These are my photos. Uh, my first trip there, uh, I just I started taking a picture and I'm like, you gotta stop. 
get put the camera down, put the camera, really look. And you're here to see these butterflies, put the camera down. And then you'd walk about three feet and you go, oh, 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 oh look, here's three of them together. And, and, and put the camera down. And I had, you know, uh, you get to stay for 20 or 30 minutes or so. Um, there are other people, and again, you don't want to have huge crowds disturbing the atmosphere, disturbing the terrain, all of that sort of thing. So you get to stay for 20 or 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, I was standing there, and uh, I'll show you another picture while I'm telling you this part of the story. Um, I realized, I, you call it lucky, blessed, whatever you want to call it, that I had... I was standing there seeing something that, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world and I got to go see this. And I had the health to do it. I had the money to do it. I had the time to do it. We can get in a plane and fly down there and be there. And it just kind of takes your breath away to, to realize that. And I still kind of, wow, it's great, great opportunity to have. And this one, we'll try this one. Oh. <laughs> and that's that's what you're standing there just taking it all in. Just you see here the wind, you can hear the wind. Is that snow? Those are the butterflies. The whitish Oh, no, that would be other butterflies oh. on the trees. And Why sunlight, sunlight as well. Why butterflies? Well, they, um, if you see the picture on the right there, mm -hmm. you see how. Oh, because their wings, uh, they, it's, when they're closed, they're wide. Is that well, actually, it's my understanding, and don't, don't put money on this. But my understanding is as they are losing energy, they've been there since November. This is literally, they overwinter, they, they sit on the trees, they, they enter what's called diapause. They eat very little and they can't mate or reproduce at this stage. That's how their body is just um, reduced you know, their, their energy output, because they have to last from November to March. And then these guys are going to go and fly up to Northern Mexico and Texas and reproduce them. So, you know, I mean, there's science, uh, scientists all over that are studying this little butterfly. How does this happen? How does this happen? And, um, I listened to a webinar, it was, I think it's the US uh, Forest Service or somebody like that put on a webinar that I listened to. There was an outfit in, I think it was Minnesota, one of the universities there, they say, okay, you got this butterfly that flies up to North America and there's another generation and another generation and another generation and another generation, and then that guy knows to fly back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and number, how do they know what direction to go? <laughs> so they literally did an experiment. And they had this wind tunnel kind of thing. It's all totally enclosed, no sunlight or anything like that. So they put the uh, butterflies in there. And they showed like artificial light because here it is morning, here it's night, here it's sunset, whatever. Apparently what they have figured out is, I don't think you can see a little bit, you know, butterflies have two antennas. And they have a little bitty bump or club at the end of that antenna. What they figured out is there are two little uh, primitive brains in each antenna. Wow. And that butterfly somehow knows that when the sun is over here in the morning, it's been dark all night, it's sunny now, that's morning, that's, this, this antenna is recognizing that he's supposed to go that way. And then as it gets to sunset, 
the other antenna is picking that up. That's how the butterfly knows to go south and what direction they're going. Mm -hmm. And we think we're the top dog. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's pretty fascinating. And, and you know, uh, I'll never know all of it. So, uh, okay, well, I think we just saw the video. So yeah, I guess we're going to see the video again. <laughs> I guess, can I? There we go. Okay. We put that. Uh, down here in the bottom right is a another preserve that I went to the first time. Much more commercialized. It's called um, uh, El Rosario. And uh, probably if you just plug something into the internet, that's the one that's going to come up first. But it was much more commercialized, very crowded. Uh, lots of uh, similar experience of uh, the uh, volume and um, uh, number number of butterflies is what I'm trying to get at. The middle picture is just to show you, get kind of an idea of the height and the size and the structure of the tree. Looks pretty much like fir trees around here. And then on the right, I said, huh, it looks like a Christmas tree. So it's that similar style of tree. But um, this, again, this was more of a deciduous tree over here on the left. But you can just see how they're just all over the place. They're out there sunning. It's probably about 11 o'clock in the morning. By this time, the sun was well up. Uh, as the sun gets, it gets cooler in the day and the sun is going down, they'll, again, they'll just park themselves on the uh, trees. And the picture on the right is just, you cannot imagine, you cannot see the wood, the bark of the tree, because there are so many butterflies covering that tree. And, you know, you're used to fir trees, the branches are like this. These branches were like, they were just weighted down with so many, um, let me see, get the right, so many butterflies on there. And again, this is why when they're trying to estimate how many butterflies there are, how many monarchs are down there, they have to do some kind of a broad guess at uh, how many hectares are, are inhabited by the butterflies and how thick they are. So, and more. there are no other types of butterflies, is that correct? It's just the monarchs in these areas. Well, yeah, primarily. Mm -hmm. The other butterflies that we see around here, they hibernate during the winter. Um, and but these these make the trek, and um, that's just my favorite picture. That's <laughs> with a little girl. Her family uh, had a booth there at that El Rosario, and and she wore you know they just put her up there to attract attention with her sure. her butterfly wings. But she's just adorable, I thought. So. Um, Something I've learned that this, this is the original uh, monarch population. There's also a population in California. They do not mix with these uh, this population down in central Mexico. They will go down into Mexico, but not very far. And they just go back and forth. And it, you may have heard of like um, probably the, it was the summer of 19 or the summer of 20 where they, that, the monarch population had crashed like 90% or something. It was the California population that had plummeted so badly, but they came back the next year. There's also colonies over in Florida. They're called tropical monarchs. They really don't mix with these. Um, I just was researching today, when I very first started to put this together several months ago, I got on and I found monarchs in Europe that would migrate to Northern Africa. I'm like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. But apparently they are transported. They are not native there. They have been transported by, you know, how we get stuff and wood from China and things, invasive things. So they're not considered invasive in Europe, but that's where the European monarchs come from. They're also in Southeast Asia, down around the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia, and those kind of places. But 
the ones that we have here in Mexico and in Northern uh, America are considered the original colonies. So now, what are we gonna do about this? We all hear about milkweed and how we have to have milkweed. It's not just about milkweed. Uh, this is purple coneflower down here on the left, Coreopsis there in the middle. The white is called Slender Mountain Mint. These are all in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the monarch is on another coneflower uh, up there at the top. Mm -hmm. But these are all natives. Um, and I think that the next slide, yeah, there we go. In the spring, the milkweed plants are the host plant. That is the only plant that the monarch butterfly will lay her eggs. The, uh, there are four, what they call instars, before it gets to the chrysalis that eventually becomes a butterfly. But all of that takes place on a milkweed plant because the milkweed is, provides the nutrition for that larvae to turn itself into a butterfly. And these uh, six, seven that I have showing up there are uh, common, in, well, I won't say they're common in Missouri, they are found, they're native to Missouri. And um, that's why people talk about planting the milkweeds. We need to plant milkweeds um, because, um, and the butterfly milkweed, believe it or not, is not the most effective and nutritious for the butterflies. Somehow it got called the butterfly weed, but, uh, mixing is a good idea. Some, some uh, do better in a wetter environment, some do better in a drier environment, that sort of thing. I put up some uh, uh, brochures, the milkweed, uh, monarchs and milkweeds, or milkweeds and monarchs, I forget which, which yeah. Um, uh, it has a great, a uh, lot of information. Any of those at first, I only got 10. I'm sorry, I went to MDC and I picked up 10 of each. And I'm sorry, uh, we didn't have enough for everybody, but um, any of this is available at the MDC website. And I have some, some other resources on the last slide, but you see they're, they're pretty flowers to have in your yard too, anyway. So, um, so that's in the spring. You primarily, you want to have the uh, the milkweeds available summer. They're very uh, prominent during the summer as well. Um, but in the fall, as I told you, they're not laying eggs at this point. They're trying to gather energy to get back to Mexico. So it's important to have what we call the nectar plants because that's where they get their energy from. Uh, popping on to things like these asters. This is, I took these photos, but they're my neighbor's asters. So <laughs> I just, I was walking one day, walking the dog, I think, and um, I went by and there were like two dozen monarchs on this, uh, you know, I had kind of a larger uh, set of plants there. And I ran home and I just knew they were going to be gone by the time I got back with my camera. But I was so excited. I was I, I just love these photos. I particularly like this one down here on the bottom left, the, the black and white polka dot. Um, I didn't realize that when I wore this thing, but um, anyway, they're just beautiful, beautiful butterflies. And um, okay, these all look like females. There's a way to tell the males, but I don't know if I have a, uh, a photo of a male. But anyway, we wanted to have a large variety. And the other thing is other butterflies use other types of plants as host plants. There's a, a pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. It lays its eggs on the Dutchman's pipe vine flower plant, I should say. That's why it's called the pipe vine. And swallowtails are, um, I'm not the world's expert on which Butterfly goes with which plant, but um, somebody else here is probably better at that than I am. But uh, the other thing is, don't forget trees and shrubs. Uh, our our red buds, our dogwoods um, provide nectar. Uh, you know, no matter which direction they're going, they they lay their eggs on the milkweed, but they they will go to all these other plants as well to gather energy from the nectar. So. 
um, and natives. Um, for thousands of years, these butterflies have been making this movement and all the other butterflies and the bees that we have and the native bees and that sort of thing. They want to have the plants that they have been having for generations and generations and generations. Unfortunately, when we go to, uh, I hate to say it, the big box stores and they say, oh, look, we have milkweed, but it might not be a milkweed that is indigenous to Missouri. There's something called tropical milkweed. Remember I said there's a group in Florida. They like the tropical milkweed because they're in the tropics. These um, butterflies do not get, uh, are not going to want to use that tropical milkweed because it's not adapted to this colony of, of butterflies. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah and I heard, um, Okay, go ahead. I heard that the tropical milkweeds too wasn't good for a while. I had it in my yard and they just flocked to it and I had chrysalises all along the windowsills and everything else. But then I read that it was bad for them and so I took it out of the this, swamp. The other type, swamp. yeah, yeah. Um, again, uh, the other thing you want to watch out for when you go to purchase plants is, um, let me see if I can go back. You see how I have a uh, common milkweed, Asclepia syriaca. Um, that is the botanical name of that milkweed. Um, we get, uh, the people who do this all the time get real worried about using common names versus botanical names. When you go to the store or the nursery and you say, I want some swamp milkweed, if it says Asclepius incarnata, and then it has another name with quotation marks around it, that's a hybrid or a cultivar. And it has been changed uh, biologically from the swamp milkweed that is just in Asclepius incarnata. And that exhausts my knowledge of that. So. <laughs> I ordered mine online. Yeah. And it was from someplace that encourages the monarchs. Yeah. I've got, like I said, the last slide I have has a, a variety of resources. And we'll talk about each of those in a minute. Um, let me see what's next here. Oh, this, uh, okay. Yeah, we've already looked at this picture. There we go. Um, these are a variety of native plants that you can put in your yard. And this is list is not exhaustive whatsoever. Um, uh, violets are some of my favorites. I grew up, I don't know, I guess it's what I grew up with in my yard growing as a little kid out there digging around. Um, this is a variety of violet that has a white flower on it, not just the uh, the purple. It's just a different, it's part of the a different species within the family. Um, people just go, oh, I got those violets. I'm trying to rip them out and all this kind of stuff. Fritillary butterflies. Violets are the host plant for fritillary butterflies. And those are the real pretty brown and gold uh, butterflies that you might see. This picture in the center is called Ohio horse mint. It's a really neat plant. It, it has almost, you can't hardly see it in this picture, but these are actually like little individual flowers that go up the stalk. And uh, a lot of our pollinators like that particular one. That was a picture I took out at the botanical gardens. The picture on the right is called Amsonia. And this is called the uh, blue star. It's a five petaled uh, plant. You don't see many of those. And, and it, it goes from a little blue thing when it starts out to be in the white flower that you see there. So again, this is not at all an ex uh, exhaustive list, but some things, asters and goldenrods, uh, they are just starting to come into bloom now. And as I told you a little bit ago, the uh, butterflies that monarchs that I have seen in my yard come through in September and October. Well, your daisies and things are, you know, 
dahlias a lot of those kind of things are are spent and gone and you're thinking you ought to take them out and throw them away they need nectar plants in august and september and october so uh the asters i have uh i have new england aster that uh i i keep a garden journal those things don't blossom until the end of october like around the 20th of october just be uh for one they're a late bloomer and then the location i have them in they they just uh uh bloom at that time. And goldenrod, you're not allergic to goldenrod, you're allergic to ragweed, which blooms at the same time. So don't worry about the goldenrod. Brenda? It's like in the fall, I know a lot of dinos that Yeah. Yeah. Do they get nutrition from the dinos? Yes, they will. They'll get sugar. The nectar is sugar. And here, we're going to try something here. Hey, it worked. Yay. Yay. Heather and I learned how to do this on Monday. <laughs> These are the New England asters that are going to be a late bloomer. And the, the, the photos that I'm going to show you here are fall blooming because uh, we haven't even mentioned the heirloom seed library yet. Part of the presentation today is about the heirloom seed library. And uh, fall is a really great time to plant natives. They can you get the plant or the seed into the ground. It overwinters, it freezes, thaws, freezes, thaws. And then next uh, spring, it'll be ready to pop out for you. That yellow flower at the top is an ashy sunflower. If you've ever seen one of those, who knows what's in the bottom left? Yeah. Yay, good job, good job. I tried to trick you by making it real good. But, um, they are, they're a nectar plant. They're a nectar plant for our pollinators. This is yarrow. It can be a fall bloomer. And this is your goldenrod. You're going to start seeing a lot of that on the roadside. We think. And gets, oh no, where did it go? I lost my zinnia picture. There was a zinnia at, from my yard. It'll probably, it'll show up somewhere later when I least expect it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm really proud of myself. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, here's our, uh, and don't, I, you know, two of them are links that got highlighted. Uh, all, the others are just, I guess I just typed out the websites. Missouri Department of Conservation. The handouts that I had, they are from the Department of Conservation. You can always go online and either order some, or you can look at the publication right there on their website. And much, much, much more, more information. Missouri Botanical Garden is always my go-to if I want to know really good information uh, about a particular flower. They have a plant finder. You can say sunflower. You can put in ashy sunflower and it'll pop up. It'll tell you where to plant it, what time it's going to bloom, what color. Uh, la, 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 la. I, everything that you want to know in Missouri Botanical Garden. Missourians for Monarchs is a good one. I went to that one this morning and printed some stuff out. In case you asked me a question I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation uh, has, again, an excellent source of information. They have the Grow Native program. Some of you probably got the Grow Native brochure there. That's another good source to show you pictures of what you're going to get. And uh, the Xerces Society is the insect, uh, what do you call it, invertebrate, insect. Um, so they, they have information about bees, butterflies, uh, little, little flying insects. Journey North is, again, they, um, there is all about migration. So they have bird migration information and, and other uh, migratory uh, information. Homegrown National Park. This is something that's pretty brand new. And I went and I registered my yard with homegrown national park. I keep calling it backyard national park and then nothing comes up. It's homegrown national park. If you have native plants and trees and flowers in your yard, you can go 
and register your yard. And the concept behind this is, you know, we have big national parks, we have Wilson's Creek, places like that, that have native plants, but we're never going to be able to have enough real estate in our national parks to provide what we need, the habitat that these birds, our insects, our butterflies and everything need. So your yard can be part of a national park. You have your own private national park and whether you let me come in or not, you know, <laughs> I have one of those senior passes. So you have to <laughs> but Missouri Waffle, the last two, are very, very good sources for native plants. Um, Missouri Wildflower Nursery is just outside of Jefferson City. They come down here frequently. Ozark Soul is a fellow that I got to know through Master Gardeners. He used to be a gardener uh, out at the Botanical Garden and he and his wife have started a business here in Southwest Missouri uh, selling native plants. They have good quality and they stand behind them. Um, there will be several sales coming up in the fall. I can't tell you exact dates today, but um, if you go to either one of those websites, I'm sure they, they have what sales are coming up. And they also have other sales in the springtime as well. 